What's up everyone? Lance Hedrick here. I'm super excited about today's video. Today I'm going to um, do something a little different. I started my YouTube channel uh, with a lot of espresso and milk videos and today I'm going to just switch gears and start doing some filter coffee. For those of you that might not know, uh, on top of my uh, competitive history in latte art, I've also been a seasoned competitor in Brewers Cup Championships and I'm very, very uh, passionate about filter coffee and pour overs. Now, this might be a shock to some of you, but actually about 80 to 90% of all the coffee I consume are pour overs. So today we're gonna jump into it. We're gonna do kind of my style of an exposition on what filter coffee is, and we're gonna just um, dig into it. So let's begin. The things we're gonna look at today, we're gonna look at um, the tools that we need in order to create pour overs or manual brew. So we're gonna look at some different brewers and how they work. We're gonna talk about extraction theory. And some of this is going to be a speculation that I've picked up from different forums and from different blogs. Um, I will be relying a lot on Jonathan Gagne, who is an astrophysicist up in Montreal, who's been doing a lot of great work with his blog, Ad Astra. Um, he's coming out with a book soon called The Physics of Pour Over Coffee. So I'll be relying on some of the stuff I've seen from there as well. Um, we're also going to get into the actual process of brewing and what each stage looks like and I'm going to break it down in uh, the way that I enjoy breaking things down. So it's, this is going to be an exhaustive video. I encourage you if you're not into longer videos look down uh, down below in the caption and I will have time cues for each of these sections. So if you want to skip over equipment because you're like I have my equipment you can skip over that go straight to my extra this extraction theory that I'm going to go over or you can skip that as well if you're not interested and you can go straight to the process um, where I talk about uh, why we bloom, what channeling is, how it occurs, bypass, and different things like that. So buckle up because here we go. All right. As you all know, my channel is all about accessibility, so I'm going to start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start as we learn from Sister Maria in The Sound of Music, all right? So, very beginning, pour over coffee, percolation. What we are doing in pour over coffee is we are literally taking really hot water and we are dumping it over a bed of grounds, all right? And grounds, I'm just referring to ground up coffee, all right? And what's going to happen in this is we are extracting the coffee with this hot solvent, water, the universal solvent, we are pulling the things out from inside and we are bringing it to the final cup. So all pour overs are is you're taking water from some sort of kettle, doesn't have to have this fancy neck, and we're pouring it over ground up coffee. All right, that's all pour over is. So if you're sitting there going, what is a pour over? That's what it is. An AeroPress is not a pour over, technically. You can make it a pour over by putting a filter in here and not plunging with it. But for the all intents and purposes, it is not a pour over though we can make it a pour over. All right, now pour overs are like the Chemex, right? We put a filter in here, we put coffee in the filter, and we pour water on top of it. The Kalita, we put a filter in here, we put coffee in there, we pour water on top of it. The V60, filter, coffee, water. You get where I'm going. And this is a new brewer, the Tricklet. You put a filter inside here, you put coffee on top, and then you pour through this screen, right? And then in the same way, drip coffee is essentially pour over. It's just an automated pour over, right? You just have a shower screen, raining all over the bed of water, all right? Um, so um, that is the idea of what pour over coffee is. It's just pouring water over coffee, all right? Let's talk about what all you need in order to even perform pour overs. There's no point in talking about pour overs if you, if you aren't equipped to make them. So let's talk about the things that I think are necessary to make a proper, repeatable pour over. Now, obviously, some of these things aren't necessary. You can just, you can grab any, you can grab a mug of coffee, or you can grab a mug, you can take a filter and just plop it over a mug and make a pour over, that's fine. But to be more repeated, to be more consistent, there are some things that are helpful. Now, one of those would obviously be some sort of pour over device. So like having a V60 or having a Kalita. Another thing that's important is having some sort of kettle. Now you'll see mostly these gooseneck kettles, and it's called gooseneck because the neck's like a goose, um, uh, some sort of kettle. Granted, technically, to make pour overs, you don't even need a kettle, you could take a saucepan, right? But a kettle will give you a lot more control, and if you have a gooseneck, even more control over where that stream is hitting. You can take just a tea kettle as well, or anything of the sort. I highly recommend having some sort of scale. I like to use Akaya, Time More, uh, Hario Drip Scales. There's a lot of great scales out there. Get a scale, I recommend that goes down to the tenth of a gram. Uh, of course, this is not necessary. You can also measure with a tablespoon. It's just, there's so much variation between coffees, it's difficult to repeat. 
If you have a really dark roasted coffee, it's going to be a lot more brittle. And then the same amount of uh, the same uh, a tablespoon of that is not going to weigh the same as a tablespoon of a really lightly roasted coffee. So you can get some repeatability, but if you switch coffees at all, it's going to be a little bit different, and it's going to be difficult to really measure what you're doing. All right. So I highly recommend having a scale. You'll need some sort of paper filter, metal filter, or cloth filter. I named those three. I only really use paper filters, but these other two uh, can give you a different, a different experience in the cup, which we'll get to later. But you need some sort of filter in order to create a pour over, whether that's uh, f uh, paper, metal, or cloth, all right? Now, what you also need for all of this is some sort of grinder. Granted, you can use pre-ground coffee, but as, as I'm sure you already know if you're watching this video, freshly ground coffee is going to be the, your best bet for a properly complex, nuanced cup. Okay, uh, today I'm going to be using the Commandante hand grinder. Uh, these hand grinders do a great job of zero retention, so you're not really wasting coffee. Um, so you can dose right at 20 grams, you're going to get 20 grams ground, right? So these are kind of the tools of the trade, what you're going to need. On top of those, things that aren't thought of as often as a tool would be water. So I have with me, I have with me three different um, water companies that will give you a packet, or you can buy packets of their minerals to mineralize distilled water. Now this is not something you have to do, but it will greatly elevate your coffee drinking experience. If you think about it, over 98% of a cup of filter coffee is water. So it's very important what water we're using. And if you really want to nerd out on this, I'm going to link in the caption below a paper by Christopher Hendon, a chemist up at the University of Oregon, uh, where he talks about the properties in water and how they interact with coffee. But these three that I have here, Aquacode, Perfect Coffee Water, and Third Wave Water. Now all you do with these is you buy a gallon of distilled water, you take one of the packets, dump it in, shake it, you got good water uh, that was created by people who have uh, tested time and again what reacts best in their opinion to coffee. Now, you don't need these in order to create some really nice coffee, but I would highly recommend not using tap water, not using distilled water, not using uh, you know whatever you have filtered out of your fr refrigerator. Instead, what I recommend doing if you don't want to you know spend have a monthly allowance to get some sort of powder in order to make your own water, what I would recommend is this. some sort of $20, $30 Brita or Pure or whatever uh, water filtration that you can just fill water in there and allow it to filter out uh, and really kind of soften some of that uh, water that's coming out of your sink. This will be better than just using tap water. It's not the best, but it will give you some really nice cups. In fact, I'll be honest, probably 50% of the time I'm using this because I frequently run out of my uh, mineral packs and am too lazy and forgetful to replenish them. So I actually use this quite a bit and I'm able to get some really nice cups, especially with certain coffees. All right, so let's move on. How does extraction work in pour overs? Well, we need to consider two different processes that occur in extraction, depending on the method. We have pour overs, we have immersion, we have vacuum, and we have uh, things like espresso, right? Which is uh, this really high pressurized type of uh, extraction going on. In pour overs, we're mainly dealing with diffusion. Diffusion, which we all remember from uh, uh, Miss Frizzle in the Magic School Bus, right? Um, seventh grade, eighth grade physical science. Diffusion is this act where things in an area of high concentration will move to an area of lower concentration, right? It's very simple. If it's too crowded in a room, people are gonna to migrate to an empty room. Same thing happens in coffee. In our coffee grounds, we have some nice goodies. Those goodies give off really nice things, but we have to get in and take them out. The way that we do that is saturate the grounds with water. Once that water is inside and it's like, wow, two, uh, three's a crowd or whatever the saying is, it's gonna start pushing the goodies out. The goodies are like, wow, there's less pressure outside of the ground, so I'm gonna escape. And they're like, freedom. And then we're like, huh, I'm gonna drink you actually. So. Um, that is kind of what's going on whenever hot water touches coffee. We're going to have diffusion occurring, all right? There's another process that occurs, though, in some other brew methods and, to an extent, in pour-over coffee, and that is called wash-out kinetics. This happens a lot in espresso, a lot in an AeroPress, um, and anything that you're adding pressure to. This is the act of really washing the, these insolubles that might be in your bed of coffee and forcing them into your final cup. It's also taking some of the coffee fibers, the, the cell wall fragments, and different things like that and forcing it through, uh, like those brew colloids that I referred to earlier. And that's why we can use a ratio of one to two in espresso and have a high extraction over 20% 
in the same way that we have a 20% extraction filter coffee, but it has a lot less body. It's because of that washout kinetics. Now, gravity can give you some of that washout kinetics. And that's why when we use something like a mesh filter, we're gonna get some colloids through it. But it's a lot more minimal than say espresso or an AeroPress. You have a lot more viscous body in an AeroPress because you're adding that force. So washout kinetics come to play. So keep those in mind. Whenever we are extracting coffee, those are the things in play, all right? So, all that we're doing in extraction is diffusion for the most part in pour overs with a little bit of washout kinetics. And this brings me to the next point, which I alluded to earlier. Which filter should we use when we're brewing coffee? Well, paper filters are an option, mesh filters are an option, and cloth filters are an option. Mesh filters are obviously not gonna hold very much back. There are a lot of holes in it, like in a French press or like an Abel cone, which you can put in a Chemex to brew. What's gonna happen in a mesh filter is a lot of those brew colloids are gonna be able to escape through these big holes, okay? And this is going to make a more viscous cup and it's going to cover the acidity that we have extracted through diffusion, all right? So if you're wanting a cup with a lot of body and not much acidity, a mesh filter might be the way for you to go. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have paper filters. Paper filters hold back a lot of those colloids, don't allow many to go through depending on their thickness, and give you a really nice clean cup with a high acidity. The acidity is the same essentially in both cups, but the perception of it is higher when using a paper filter. Now in between those, you have a cloth filter. The cloth filter is better at holding back some of those uh, colloids than say the mesh filter is, okay? Um, but it still allows some through. So you're gonna kind of get a balanced cup between the two polar opposites, right? So the cloth filter is in the middle. Granted, I wear sandals, so I don't carry socks with me. So today I don't have a cloth filter. Okay, that was a terrible joke, but it was a joke nonetheless. People have been asking for me to bring back the humor. Stand up comic here. All right, so we have the paper, the mesh, and the cloth. And so you're gonna pick based off of those. Granted, the cloth is a lot more difficult to clean. So if you're gonna use it, um, make sure that you're cleaning it really well or it can mildew and get kind of gross and funky. Um, all right, next thing I wanna hit in this process is the actual process of brewing coffee. Now, for this, I want to begin uh, with the bloom. The bloom is the beginning where we're dousing water onto our bed of grounds. Now, in the bloom, there is something that, uh, uh, the thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to rid the bed of CO2. Now that's one of a two-fold event that's going on. We are trying to, we're priming the bed by ridding the bed of CO2. And actually I have a diagram for this that I'm gonna cover the screen with. Now on this diagram, you're gonna see a cross section of a ground. Let me say this clearly. This cross section is not accurate. This is not actually what a ground looks like. For my illustrative purposes, this is what it looks like, okay? So on the inside of a ground, what you have in the very middle, or your, or your, well, in the very, very middle, you have your bitters. So the more you penetrate the ground, the more those bitters are gonna come out. Just outside of those bitters are the goodies, the things that taste delicious, the sugars, the acids, and the, uh, and the alike, right? Those fats that can really give you some sort of body, right? So that's the goodies, that pink part right there. Just outside of that is the carbon dioxide. That stuff doesn't want you to extract. It is the gatekeep to uh, those nice sugars that we're trying to get to. So the first thing we have to do in order to get out those goodies is we've got to wet those grounds and allow the CO2 to escape in order to penetrate and pull out those nice goodies. All right, so keep that image in mind. Again, it is not accurate. It's kind of like in that seventh, eighth grade physical, or, or in chemistry in seventh or eighth grade where they talk about electrons as little BBs, when in reality we know it's more like a wave, but it's not a wave, it's this whole, and I'm gonna bring up quantum physics again, it's mind-boggling, it's here, but it's here, but it's nowhere at the same time. With the ground, this is obviously not an accurate projection in the slightest, but the illustrative purposes are there. I want you to realize you've gotta get through that moat in order to storm the castle. You gotta get that CO2 out. So the bloom phase is in order to degas the grounds, priming them for extraction. All right, now, I said there's kind of two purposes to the bloom, uh, and that's sort of correct. Um, after you get some of those CO2 out, there are still grounds in the bed that have not degassed, all right? And so when you make your second pour, some of those are gonna degas and there are gonna be bubbles coming up. And obviously, let's think about it, as those bubbles come up, what's gonna happen? Those bubbles are gonna create little tunnels through our bed, allowing channeling. If you've watched my espresso videos, you know what channeling is, but I'll quickly uh, talk about it once more. Channeling is when water 
finds pads of least resistance and exposes them. So as that CO2 is coming up, it is messing with our bed structure and it is allowing channels to occur rapidly. And that's going to skew our extraction, all right? So whenever we are doing this bloom, we need to ensure that we are being as fully saturated as possible. We are getting all those grounds fully wet at the same time as best as we can, all right? So I have another illustration that I toiled over, so please appreciate it right here. And it's going to show you what a flat bed bloom will look like and a divoted bed will look like. Now, this has been a famous thing that people have been talking about a lot in recent times. So I wanted to kind of show you what's going on. And I'm obviously using a conical device for this illustration. Now, on this one side, you see the flat bed. Whenever you bloom the coffee, the water is going to go in and it's going to escape from the sides because it's less pressure to go to the sides of that filter and kind of bypass the bed. And that bottom bit that I have circled in red is not going to want to be saturated. Now on the other side, I have a bed with a divot in it. This is going to make the bottom part of that conical filter where the grounds are stuffed. It's gonna allow more accessibility for that water to hit that area, fully saturate them at the same time as the rest of the grounds. All right, so I'm back on my face because this is the Lance show. This is very important. Um, we need to saturate fully that bed of grounds so that we can begin diffusion. We want to begin pulling out the sweetness and the acidity as quickly as possible and as uniformly as possible to have the most balanced cup as possible. Now this is gonna be impossible if we're not getting all those grounds saturated fully. So I tend to recommend doing some sort of divot regardless of the brew device. And I know that sounds crazy, I'll go more into it later, but doing some sort of divot in order to ensure that we are saturating the bed fully. Now. Uh, there's another thing that you can do, which we'll get into more in another video, which is called, you know, the swirl or the, st uh, the spin, where you kind of spin your brewer and that allows that water to really fully saturate. You could also stir uh, with a spoon. I don't recommend doing that, um, which again, I'll get into later. But this bloom is of critical importance because it rids the bed of CO2 and primes those grounds for extraction, for that diffusion to occur, okay? now. Let's continue with that brew. The next thing that's going to come out, broadly speaking, are those acids that we perceive as like sour. And this goes back to the salami shot that we pulled in that espresso video. The beginning of extraction are those acids that are dominant in sour uh, flavors, okay? So like that high acidity. That's why when we under extract a coffee, under extract, it's a relative term. That's when we under extract a coffee, it's gonna taste more sour. Now, as you keep with the extraction, those more complex sugars are gonna come out. And as you keep pushing extraction, those really bitter type of uh, notes are gonna come out and kind of overwhelm the cup. You're gonna get an astringent cup, drying cup, etc. All right, so that's kind of how uh, all coffee is going to extract is sour, sweet, bitter. All right, same thing in pour over coffee and percolation. Now, what I wanna get into now, and I know this is a lot of information, that's why the time keys below, you can come back and reference. What I wanna get into now is what Jonathan Gagne, that astrophysicist I alluded to earlier, what he refers to as the four big rules of percolation, all right? Number one is trying to lessen or negate completely bypass. Well, what is bypass, you ask? All right, bypass is when water is literally going beside the bed of coffee during a pour over and missing it completely. You can't get a visual image of that? That's all right, I've done one more illustration for you because I love you so much, and boom, here it is. All right, so as we see on uh, what would be the side of the screen, it would be your left side. Um, on the left side, this left illustration, what you see is water being poured into a V60 or some sort of conical device. The water is going to pull up on top and it's wanting to go to the path of least resistance. Because of the ribs inside of a V60, the filter is not suctioning against the wall. There is a little bit of space. And guess what? It's easier to go through that permeable filter and go beside the filter of the coffee where that coffee is and completely miss the coffee. So I'm not saying all of the water is gonna do this, but there's going to be a hefty amount that is going to completely miss that water, I mean that coffee. And so the more that we do that, the less control we have over the brew, the lower the extraction yield is going to be. All right, so we wanna lessen that bypass. Well, how do we do that? Well. It's difficult, but one of the things we're going to try and do is ensure that we have the filter as close to the side as possible, potentially suctioning it, right? And some brewers allow us to do that, most do not. And as I said in the V60, there are these ribs that allow the filter to be pushed off and propped up. So there's inevitable bypass going to happen. Is bypass the worst thing in the world? No, and that's why I kind of like to amend the rule and say less bypass. Bypass, it, it, I mean, it's going to happen in most every brewer unless you have one like the tricklet that disallows it. Now you may be asking, how does this brewer disallow it? In it, you're gonna put a filter that covers the bottom and then all of the water 
has to go through all of the coffee. There's no way for it to bypass because there's no filter on the side. All of the water has to go by through all of the coffee and drip through. But this really is the only uh, no bypass brewer out there. Um, so it's gonna be difficult, but you can get uh, as little bypass as possible. And some of the ways of doing that is ensuring that you're uh, doing smaller pours. Uh, the higher you have that bed over the bed of grounds, or the, the, the higher you have the water level over the bed of grounds, the more water is going to bypass, right? So if you do smaller pours, you're gonna have a little, a little less bypass. You're still gonna get bypass, and you'll have a lot of partial bypass, but it's not gonna be complete bypass, all right? And when I say partial bypass, by the way, if we have that V60 here, water's gonna come in all directions, right? Some's gonna come through here and it's gonna go through a bit of the coffee and then it's gonna bypass. And then some's gonna go through all of the coffee, right? But not all the water's gonna go through all the coffee in any brewer, really, all right? So we have to learn how to uh, work with that. Now, crazily, you're still able to get repeatability even with this uncontrollable bypass. So don't worry about it. Don't freak out and say, I need to get this trickle because I need no bypass. No, in fact, my favorite brewers uh, still have some bypass. It's just something to, to keep in mind. I personally don't like the frilly filters of like the Kalita or the Fellow because uh, there's so many places for bypass to occur and I tend to find pretty inconsistent brews with that. So I tend to brew on conical devices or using conical filters and flat bottom brewers. All right, so that's that first rule. The second would be to avoid clogging. I know that you all have had stalled out brews if, you're, if you've done pour overs before. We need to learn how to avoid that. One way is to ensure that we're not using a thin filter in a flat bottom brewer. So like here, we have tiny little holes in the Kalita. If we have a thin flat bottom brewer, what'll happen is that filter will sag and will clog up those holes. And what do I mean by clog? Obviously, it's not going to suck through and disallow anything from happening. But if the filter is completely covering the hole, then you only have this much room for escape. Granted, there, there's only that much room for escape in general, but the surface area of where the coffee can escape now is this big. Originally, if it's sitting up and is not clogging those holes, you have a lot more surface area of the bottom of that hole filter, as well as the sides. So you have a lot of area for the coffee to escape, and then it'll drain through the holes. If the holes get clogged, now you only have this tiny little couple of millimeter big holes where the coffee can escape. So we need to avoid clogging at all costs uh, so that we have that nice flow rate. The next rule, just speeding through these, is to have an even flow rate. Now, this is where a good grinder co uh, comes into play big time. Uh, and I have actually, uh, on that slide we just saw with bypass, I also have uh, the fears of uneven grind size. So I'm gonna get that, that, filter, that um, slide back up. It's the one on your right. So if you see, in this filter, on the left side, we have a lot of boulders, a lot of bigger grounds of coffee. And on the right side, we have a lot of smaller grounds of coffee. Now, obviously, because there's less space between the smaller grounds of coffee, water is not gonna wanna run through those. It's gonna wanna go through those bigger grounds of coffee because there's more space between them. It's easier for water to trickle through. So, that's gonna be an uneven flow rate through the bed. You're going to over-extract that one side of the bed and the fines that may live over there, you're gonna under-extract the other side, right? So you're gonna have a very uneven, uh, unbalanced cup of coffee, imbalanced cup of coffee. So we need to ensure that we are uh, getting a proper and even flow rate based off of our grind, based off the filter we're using, uh, based off of all these different variables we've been discussing. So try to ensure we have a constant and even flow rate through the bed of coffee, all right? And then that final rule is understanding the relationship between grind size and ratio, all right? And again, this is the fourth rule of uh, Gagne is understanding the relationship here. So if you're gonna use a tighter ratio, you should probably grind finer and vice versa. If you wanna use a finer grind size, do a little a shorter ratio because the more surface area we expose on the coffee, the more extractable it becomes, the less we should be extracting, right? Or the less water we should be giving it, I should say, because it's going to extract more quickly. The coarser the grind, the wider the ratio. So maybe a one to 15 for a finer grind, maybe a one to 17 ratio for a coarser grind. This is going to allow you to extract more, right? Makes sense, yeah? So these are kind of the four rules that Gagne is, uh, is talking about. Uh, with his rules of percolation. And I just wanted to make that available to the masses in uh, a way that I think is uh, pretty understandable. Now, the thing I want to cover last is this idea of TDS and extraction yield, total dissolved solids and extraction yield. These are numbers you hear thrown around a lot and a lot of people act like they're the end all be all. Let me assure you they are not and I'm going to break this down for you. What does TDS mean? It means total dissolved solids. What does that mean? That means in a cup of coffee, how much of that cup is actually coffee. What in that cup is not water essentially? 
So you have all that brew water we created, or no, that we created, but we heated up and we poured over our grounds. What in that final cup of coffee is actually not coffee? So TDS refers to the percentage of that final cup, what that percentage is in terms of coffee. So typically people talk about a 1.15% to a 1.35% being the optimal range for your uh, concentration of coffee in your cup. So TDS refers to concentration, right? So how much of that cup is actually coffee? Now I tend to enjoy actually closer to like a 1.3 to a 1.6%. You might enjoy a one to a 1.2, or you might enjoy a 1.6 to 2%. Who knows? It's all personal preference depending on where you're at. I just want you to understand all that, all that people are referring to when they say total dissolved solids or TDS is what percentage of their cup is actually uh, dissolved coffee as opposed to just being water molecules, okay? Extraction yield is what we can figure out based off of our total brew volume, which means after we pour water through the, gr through the grounds, what is the weight of the coffee that is created? So we have the total brew volume, or the total brew weight, I should say, and we multiply that by the total dissolved solids, okay? Once we have that product, we divide it by our, um, our massive grounds of coffee, okay? And that will give us our extraction yield. Now, typically this is between 18 and 22%. Um, the idea of no bypass is to get it up even higher. The highest I've heard is 29%, but that doesn't help you understand what does extraction yield mean. It means out of the grounds, out of the coffee that we have decided we want to extract, what percentage of those grounds have been extracted, right? So in our, let's say a V60, we've put 20 grams of coffee. Now we've poured water through it. Now obviously there's still coffee grounds in our filter that we get rid of. So obviously we're not, we don't have 100% extraction yield because there's still coffee there. If there was no coffee left, it'd be 100%. Instead, there's still coffee there. All right, coffee with some water that it, that it had soaked up. So it's still similar looking volume. In the cup though, we have a brown liquid now. It's not just water. So obviously there is coffee being dissolved, right? So extraction yield refers to the amount of those grounds that have made it into the final cup. And typically, like I said, it's 18 to 22%. You may find that you prefer higher than 22. You may find that you enjoy 17%. It really doesn't matter. It's all personal preference yet again. I tend to enjoy around 21 to 25%. Um, but again, I'm digressing uh, because it doesn't matter what I enjoy. It matters what you enjoy, all right? There are no rules. Break the rules, remember? All right, so that is just the lowdown on what extraction yield and TDS means and how you can get your extraction yield, which I'll put in the comments below if you have access to a refractometer. The equation is simple. You take your total brew weight. So when you're done brewing, take your coffee and pour it and zero out a cup on your scale pour your coffee into it and weigh how much coffee you made. You multiply that by your TDS, which a refractometer, which looks like this. This is an Atago, there's also the VST, uh, but this will tell you the TDS. It will shoot photons through the liquid sample you put on this little plate, and it will tell you what percentage of that liquid is solids, or is solubles, or is not water, essentially. And then you take that, you multiply it by the total brew weight. Once you have that product, you divide by the mass of coffee you are brewing, 20 grams of coffee, 25 grams of coffee, whatever it is. And that gets you your extraction yield. So let's put that there. So that is all extraction yield and TDS mean. All right. So that is an exhaustive look at what pour overs are. All right. And in the coming weeks, I'm going to be doing um, spotlights on certain brew methods, whether it's V60, Chemex, Kalita, a Stag X, whatever it might be. Uh, the next one will be a V60, but I would love comments below what you would like to see after the V60. I'm really excited to get into these. I am just so into filter coffee, it's outrageous. Um, so I'm excited for you to experience this as well. If you're an espresso first drinker, I'd encourage you to maybe pick one of these up so you can follow along and have some fun with us. Um, in the meantime, if you haven't watched some of my older videos, go check them out if you're into latte art. Anyway, please, please, please turn on notifications for this channel, subscribe to this channel, like the video if you like it, and if you dislike it, you know, please leave a comment, tell me what you would like to see. But in the meantime, excited to get going with this. Thank you for watching this uh, installment of Exhaustive Lectures from Lance, and I'll chat with you later. See ya.